No, I mean, can you give me the host presentation? What? Hope you can see my screen, right? Yeah. So uh, this session is the first session for the uh, Kubernetes class. Okay. And uh, in the demo class, uh, given the topics, what will be discussed. Okay. So in the first session, what we are going to do is uh, We'll just uh, kind of revisit the basics. Okay, so Kubernetes in turn, it will use the containers, okay, technologies like Docker, okay, Rocket, Podman, and all it will use. So we will try to learn those, like what are those and all. And in in the very fundamentals, they are they ultimately use the Linux uh, namespaces and C groups. Okay, so we'll just uh, see those things. We don't want to go in depth, you know, because they are not used day in day out but we'll just we'll come to know what are these things okay so it's more of uh, revisiting the basics and going through the docker stuff okay before jumping into the kubernetes so just want to know like whatever audience are there like have they worked in the uh, any container technologies like docker or anywhere have they de developed any applic like deployed any application and all like what are their experiences with the container technologies okay as i mentioned previously you know i'm managing a case sca1 okay. okay so we are managing this i mean but the end to end we are, we are managing the servers those kind of stuff but we are deploying the pod, those kind of But end of the day, I'm not sure what kind of a thing it is doing. Oh, okay, okay. no worries. Okay. I mean, it's, a, it's a new technology for everyone, actually. Sure, sure, yeah. Yeah, yeah not right. it's a new, I actually, in our end, we are managing, you know, uh, YSM, uh, YAML files, then apart mm -hmm. from that, uh, Kubernetes deployment, uh, I mean, pod deployment. So the container of which is a management for which is a management for those kind of stuff we need to know the control oh. pair, control plane control plane mm -hmm. okay Good. so i mean these are things to know the things but what it, what it does actually what is doing the functional device so we are deploying the i mean from a hybrid we and our setup is hybrid environment okay okay Thank you. Okay, and on the chat, I can see Sarah has written like uh, she's also pretty new to the Docker Hello. and Kubernetes stuff. Okay, so anyway, uh, we are revisiting the basics we are doing from like the beginning. Okay, so nothing to worry. So just to give it a quick history of it. So let's see like how that technology evolved in the last uh, like couple of years. So this I'm just using one uh, reference where it is showing the history of like the container Kubernetes, this journey completely. So before going into in depth, like we have to know, okay, how, how it evolved, what is the history, who we are dealing with here. Okay. So it all started in around, uh, around the year nine, 90s and 2000, okay, where uh, initially in the first Linux, uh, Linux version, uh, a feature was ad added, which 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 uh, like using that feature, you can isolate your process, okay, completely. So that feature was called namespaces, okay, namespace. And so, uh, uh, after that, a uh, few years, there is one more feature added. Uh, okay, you what can is namespace? Yeah, yes, we will we'll go into that. So namespace, what it does is like uh, it, it allows you. To completely isolate your process, like as a as a VM, as a virtual machine. Okay, so we have um, with namespaces. Then after that, we have a resource group. Ah, so yeah, two yes. are doing, sir. So which one is what? It, I mean, resource. What is doing? Resource, oh. I mean, what is doing? 
So those kind of concepts are, I mean, you know, quite for everyone. Yes. So this is not the, uh, don't confuse with the Kubernetes namespace. Okay. So this is uh, like the basic Linux kernel feature, okay, which is namespace. So that doesn't matter if you're using Kubernetes or containers and also this feature is already there in the native uh, Linux kernel. Okay, so th that is called namespace. We will see uh, as we go now how what is that and all. Okay, so so can I put in? Okay, it's fine. So uh, that was one of the important feature uh, namespace which was added, and I'm pretty sure like a lot of you might have seen this diagram. Okay. Uh, whoever are are working with maybe or have experience with the virtual machines or or know at least the virtualization technologies okay this is a pretty well known kind of diagram where we have the we have a server hardware infrastructure okay and maybe here uh, at top there is a hypervisor layer it could be zen server or vmware okay like that and uh, on top of that we are creating the virtual machines okay uh, I hope people get this diagram, right? The, this one, so, like whoever are, are into virtualization or cloud. Okay. Or uh, feel free to stop me, interrupt me anytime if you have any questions. Okay. And we have one more virtualization, like uh, you might have used um, maybe VMware VirtualBox, okay, or the Oracle VirtualBox, sorry, or VMware Workstation. Okay, so that is also one one of the type of virtualization. So where we have the our maybe a, a laptop or or computer or a server, the infrastructure, and on top of that we have an operating system. Okay, and on top of that uh, we will have have some hypervisor. Okay, maybe virtual box and all, and on top of that we will create the VMs. Okay, so that is one more type of virtualization. Okay, so the containers one. Uh, uh, the namespace and all what it does is that we will have the infra and we will have a common op a, a single operating system and top of that you can create your own group of processes or a single process or a group of process which can be isolated okay so that is the very native very basic feature of of the containers which is there in the linux kernel itself okay so no need to install any third party application or anything like that they are now well integrated uh, with the operating system in any native support is there. Okay. So uh, going back to the to the history of of this. Okay. So around that time, around two thousand ish, some or something. Uh, I I'm not sure about the exact date, but that time first the namespace started. Okay. Then uh, the C groups started. So namespace, what it does? Namespace isolate the things. Okay. It will just uh, if you have a a single process a application or anything you can isolate it from your app from your operating system okay or you want to host two applications okay so what it what a application is is like uh, a set of processes some files some library files some code like that okay so you are isolating two applications in two separate uh, kind of isolated space so when the application is starting whatever process id is is uh, generated so it will think that okay i am i am the only one like here there, there is no there is no other vm or anything like that so it will see it as, as its own okay so similarly we have any other uh, uh, group of processes like we want to isolate you can create like that a separate namespace and you can host your application there so both are running isolated way they they, they are not aware of each other okay so this feature what it um, gives the uh, gives the added advantage that uh, you don't have to create a full-fledged VM, okay? Like in normal virtualization and all uh, the VMware or all those, we 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 have a dedicated VMs, okay? And those take licenses, they take a lot of CPU memory, all those infra overhead, okay? And starting that time and all will be high, okay? Uh, so those things are not involved, okay? So using the namespace, you can isolate those things so then came c groups okay so these are called the uh, container groups so using container groups what we can do is whatever namespaces we have created okay we can restrict what amount of resources they can consume okay so for, for example you created a namespace called abc 
for for a web application now you can create a c group and you can allocate maybe 10 percent cpu or maybe 128 mb of ram to that uh, to that namespace okay so that feature came into like those capabilities are there in the c groups okay and uh, so those two are the fundamental technologies which uh, which were used later down the line by by the other mainstream applications okay like first the docker came so docker used those two features native features and all and it 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 gave a very good ecosystem okay for the developers and all to create the containers okay and uh, to share and also you can publish your own uh, docker file you can share those uh, in a public hub okay in a docker hub like that so that was a very uh, like it was it was a hit uh, uh, you know, within all the technology arena and uh, it for some time it was like kind of a monopoly from the docker side like they were doing a lot of advancement in, in those areas and gradually other technology leaders okay they all thought that okay we need some standardization and all okay so that time uh, also we can see kubernetes as well started here and they're also like overlapping a lot of features they are taking from the docker side and all so that time uh, it, this oci open container project th this is started okay so what it it does it, initially it was sponsored by the docker only so what it does that a lot of technologies uh, are evolving like at that time core os also in, introduced the rocket containers okay which you can use without docker okay and lxd was in installed which were using the native feature so a lot of technology was going on so they each were trying their own standards and all so this open container initiative it uh, it published a common set of standards like who, whichever company wants to create their own runtime their own image container image and also they have to adhere to some norms okay so here some some big companies and all they they grouped and they started this initiative okay and later by the time july 2015 and all we have kubernetes launched okay and there is another organization uh, apart from the OCI called CNCF. Okay. It is initiated by the Linux Foundation uh, group. So this what it does, like uh, it, it takes care of a lot of technologies like Docker also later it it donated his, uh, it donated their technology to CNCF. Even Kubernetes also gave their technology to CNCF to further manage and develop and all because they have their own uh, a set of resources and all, all, all the ecosystem around that. Okay, globally the developers will be there. They will further take that pro work on the product. So these two organizations uh, contributed a lot to these technologies, uh, the Docker and later Kubernetes. Okay, and here uh, by by this time we have uh, like once uh, Docker has given their main core. Uh, container runtime container d uh, it donated it to cncf and uh, then a lot of people started using it okay, as a open source and all and it further developed even the kubernetes uh, we have a choice of either you can use the uh, whichever runtime you want either you can go for container d or cryo okay, there are many runtimes are there okay, we can we can use that so one question would have come like what are these container runtimes and all okay so initially we discussed okay namespace and c groups are there already natively now in the in the kernel so what are these runtimes okay so uh, to use the namespace and the c groups okay it is it is not very user friendly okay as an end user uh, I, I cannot use it uh, in a very uh, useful way okay so these runtimes uh, like abstract the complexities and they will give some very high level commands okay which a end user can use and do their day in day like day to day job for that okay and uh, initially this uh, uh, 
the C groups when they developed, now it's completely there in all the operating system, all the major operating system. These these features are 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 there. Okay, and let me see if I can we can log into a server and see some namespace. And from practice point of view, like uh, if you if you're practicing at home and all, you can use like any normal your laptop and some virtualization software like uh, VMware Workstation or the Oracle Virtual Box. I personally use the Oracle Virtual Box. In the group, are there any like uh, I I hope people are using familiar with the Unix or Linux, right? Or or are there people who are completely new to the Linux? Yeah, I'm new to Linux. Oh. So uh, in in depth, we don't have to do a lot of Linux type of thing. Okay, so basic commands only we have to do, like which you can, which we will we'll gradually when we will do the more of the labs, we will come to know. Oh, I have a quick question. Could you please yeah. tell us how, how long uh, you're hoping that this class is going to take? Um, I'm not, I don't know if I missed the introductory class, but um, do you have uh, like a general overview of the class? How long it's going to take? How many yeah. times per week? Yeah. Yeah, it, it will be uh, two hours on the weekends. Okay. And uh, that um, Amit, like he is the coordinator he will do the rec record the video as well so we can get the recording and uh, saturday sunday two two hours each and uh, like that it will take around a I, I think total 30 30 hours something like that so are we gonna be learning just the main idea on kubernetes is that all for 30 hours that that isn't yeah. Much so, right. Yeah. Uh, so if you have not been on the main, uh, okay, sorry, on the demo class, uh, uh, this is our topics which we are going through. Okay. So first the basic ones where the basic Linux commands and Docker and this will be there. Then second architecture Kubernetes and third we are doing the creating the primary resources using the yaml or the cli as well okay where the pod replica sets deployment namespace all these and uh, the third one deployment strategies will be there okay and in 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 between of this like maybe in the first one we will have uh, the actual installation of the cluster as well okay it will be either a mini cube or you can have a two node cluster cluster okay in that and the next topics will be service networking, a node port, ingress, all that will be there. And persistent storage, volumes, and logging side, and topics for the helm. Okay, so these are the total, all the topics, uh, which will be there for the uh, around 30 hours. Okay. Any specific topic and all you want to add or any, anything you, you want to highlight at this point? No. 
So uh, I wanted to find out, do we, so we would not have any use case, like any use case where it covers everything. So we see how everything works. I mean, like, uh, you know, we always talk like a use case in the in, in the job site where we have an overview how all Kubernetes work. Yeah, so on the job site, actually, because you have to deploy your application. Okay, uh, so usually how it happens is the application team, there will be a separate development team will be there. Okay, so they will give you uh, the packages there, their Docker images and all. Okay, whatever developed application is there. And from there, you have to deploy that on a, on a cluster. Okay, so... It, it depends like there are different um, applications will be there. So di different organizations will have their own pipeline or their own uh, repositories how are there. So we cannot cover each of them. But uh, what we can do at the end is like, okay, whatever application is there, okay, sample application, we will deploy it on, on a cluster. Okay. And it will have a multi-node cluster and it will be accessible globally. Okay. Using a load balancer. So either you can host it on, on a Azure Azure side as well on Azure cluster Kubernetes cluster or AWS Kubernetes cluster and all. Okay. So we can even host it on our own machine wherever we are testing, but load balancer we cannot do. So what we will do is on our machine, if you are testing, we can do through node port, it will be visible. Okay. So it, it won't be visible like uh, in the internet, but if we want to test in any of those scenario, we need to have the cluster on the, uh, on the cloud. Okay. And uh, on the organizations, they also use Helm pretty much okay, in, in actual deployment and all. So, because just with the Kubernetes, it won't be helpful. Uh, Helm takes it to, a, to the next level for the deployment rollback and all that stuff. Okay. So we are covering all that point, but uh, usually in organizations, they will have different tools and many sort of different UIs and all that like Rancher and all. So those we cannot cover in this. Okay, so you're confirming that we won't be able to do a single deployment using Kubernetes, be it with AWS and see it in the cluster, see it on the URL? Yeah, yes, yeah, yes. So uh, we can do it on our own machines also. Okay, but only thing we cannot access the application globally. Okay, whatever you do, because you need a load balancer in that case. So load balancer, we can get it on the cloud deployment only. So we have to use our own like, credits and all in the either you are doing on the AWS or the Azure. So we have to use our own uh, own our subscription and all. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Sorry for taking us back. No uh, just wanted to be sure to make sure of where we're heading to. Yeah. Sure, sure. Thank you. No worries. Okay, so okay, let me increase the okay. So uh, we were discussing the namespace part. Okay, so and there are multiple types of namespaces okay we are not going to cover each of them because these are very raw level uh, like technologies which are ultimately used by the uh, docker and the high, higher level okay uh, technologies which abstract all those but we will give we'll see some some simplistic example of one one of the namespace okay so there there are different types of namespace so for example if you want uh, a process separation okay then 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 we have to go for one one namespace and let's say you want to interact uh, with one container with the other one so there is a separate namespace which deals about the networking side so there is a network namespace okay and when you want to share something from your main machine to the to the container then you need a separate namespace as a mount namespace okay and again one uh, process, if you want to interact within the container, you want to enter process communication namespace. So there are multiple namespaces are there, okay, which are again used by the top level constructs. Okay? Maybe that uh, this container D and all those will use that and Docker will again use those things. Okay, so 
let's see and so we'll we'll see a very simple uh, uh, namespace how how it is is created so one of the namespaces is uh, called uh, uh, the host name or the uh, UTS namespace. Okay. So currently what we see our host name is server 001. Okay. But when we launch uh, any container, okay, in either in Docker or in Kubernetes and all, when we launch a pod and inside that containers will be there. So we, we, we would have noticed there is some random host name is there. Okay. So that host name is different than the server host name. So how it is managed, like, won't it complete, like, uh, conflict those things or not? So one of the command which is used to manage to create the namespace is unshare. Okay, so unshare, uh, we, we can see the man page of unshare, okay. where we, it will say the unshare command creates new namespaces, okay, like that. So we, what we are going to do is if we just do tab, it, it will give us the examples, okay, which all kind of namespaces are there or, or command arguments. So what we are going to do is we are going to take the UTS names, which was used for the, for the host name. Okay. So UTS and whatever process we can attach to it. Okay. So let's say we, we want to create a shell, okay, because we have to interact with the operating system means we need to create a shell and take a bash shell. Okay. So now we are again inside one another shell, which is running in a separate namespace okay, in the UTS namespace. Now what we can see, let's change the host name to something else. Host name 005. Okay. So now we can see the host name is 005 here already set now. Okay. But it is not impacting the actual host name of the server. So let's connect it. To, Okay, so here, so here, if we see the actual ser server name is server zero zero one, it is showing. But here, our server host name commands is showing a server host name zero zero five. Okay, because this we have we are setting it inside a separate namespace. Okay, so in in a separate isolated bubble, we are doing that and we are setting the host name here. So when we exit out of that this namespace by just doing the exit command. Now we will check the host name. It is back to server 001, okay? We came back to our base machine, okay? So this, this is one of the simple example where we are using the, we are checking the uh, the UTS namespace, okay? Which which deals with the host name assignment part, okay, in, in a container. So uh, similarly to this UTS namespace, there are different namespace, user namespace, okay, because uh, you can create your own users inside the containers, okay, but they are not, they are completely separated. They are isolated users from the base machine or from a different containers, okay, so that's why there, there is a different namespace for user and similarly for networking also different namespaces are there. So these are the basic, like this is the basic, uh, uh, like the low level fundamental of the namespace. Uh, similarly, C groups also, uh, what it does when we create a namespace using the C groups, we can assign like how much CPU or how much uh, memory and all it, it can it can be allocated. Okay, so so for those uh, like there are again low level commands will be there where we have to create a C group. C -G create things. Okay, we have to install that. So commands will be CG create, uh, which is there. So the feature of the C groups are native to that, but this like uh, to manage that CLI, we need we need the CLIs. Okay. So so using a CG create command, 
we can create all the names, all, all the C groups. So let's see. So here we can see CG create, it creates a new C group. Okay. And C group, hopefully now you are aware to, to control how much resources can be allocated. Okay. To a, to a group. Okay. So for that purpose, the C groups are there. And how we create it using the CG create command. CG create hyphen, for example, G CPU. We can we can create anything like uh, my app. Okay, so let's say you want to create a C group called uh, called maybe web web server something like that. Okay, so that will that will that will get created in that, and then. We have to use further commands uh, cg I think cg set to to tell like how much uh, how much resources we want to use okay so set the parameters for a given group like how much you you want to set that how much cpu how much memory and all we want to set we have to do that here using the cg set and later once the the this c group set is created then we allocate some process like whatever application you want to run maybe a web server or whatever is there you bind it to this group okay so then whatever you are binding it or mapping it to this uh, to this c group called web server it will be restricted to whatever resources you define okay so using this we are controlling the resources okay but in actual day in day out, we do, we don't have to use these commands. I'm just showing it like how we can interact using some some CLI. But uh, for us, actually, the higher level commands like Docker or kubectl and all they take care of all these things. Okay, so we don't have to go into that uh, like in in the in depth level and run any C, create a uh, like a C group or create a namespace and all. Okay. So it will done by the higher level commands. Uh, any doubt till now? Okay, here. I think this is one of a good document. So uh, it just shows like where, how the things are fitting all together. Okay, so here we have a technology, the Docker, okay, which is prior to the Kubernetes and uh, Docker internally, like uh, this is the Docker, it will use the container runtime like container D, okay, which is, which already Docker has like donated it to the, the CNCF and they are managing it. Okay, so the Docker uses container D service and uh, Kubernetes, we have the choice. So when the Kubernetes, what it does, there is a layer here called container runtime interface, which, which is kind of an API layer. Okay. So the Kubernetes API, it will interact with this container runtime interface. And underneath you can have any number of like different, different, as, as the more technologies are coming, they can have n number of uh, whichever choice you have, you can take it. But at this point we have container D and cryo here. Okay, so you can either go for container D or or cryo, and again the container D won't manage everything. Like it is not going to create your namespace, C groups, and all. Like it, it is a middle level abstraction, and further down the line it will go to the OCI uh, layer. So OCI layer, what are, these are the standardization which is given, like how the image should be, how the C groups and all that image and all should be created, all that. And down the line, it will use the run C. Okay, so run C uh, is the low level or runtime, which does all the final management of that, which is uh, used by the Kubernetes as well, as well as by the Docker. Okay. So all this, whatever we created, the namespace and all that C groups and all, it will be ultimately done by the run C. Okay. So it, it will be responsible to create uh, our containers and all that. So this is the like all the 
pieces of puzzle you can say like uh, when we when we hear docker and all we think docker is doing everything but it is not like that so docker is ultimately using one more technology called container d and container d is further using one more component called run c okay same with the kubernetes kubernetes we have a choice either it can use container d or crio or then uh, it can it will use the run c okay so CRIO is another uh, runtime part. It is uh, created by a separate group. I think uh, IBM Red Hat and all they created the, the cryo. Okay. So container D came from the Docker, and this one came from the IBM and uh, Red Hat. Okay. Uh, any doubts till now? Or any questions? So this uh, layout, I think uh, a lot of people will be familiar, like the bottom layer, we have the hardware, then the hypervisor. Okay, so people who have worked on any any of the virtualization technologies earlier or cloud and also kind of this kind of uh, layer in this architecture is used the hardware then there is a hypervisor layer and on top of that we create the vms okay so each vm so uh, can you tell me like what are what will be the advantages of of this of of this kind of uh, architecture any examples like what will be the advantage a uh, user gets? Anyone? Okay. Yes. Okay. So uh, one of the advantage where we get is like a, a very um, optimal hardware utilization. Okay. So whatever our hardware is there, it is used uh, optimally. Like if it is only one operating system is there, maybe it is hardly used, okay, 10 or 20%. But when you are sharing these all uh, hardware, all the resources using multiple VMs, so you are optimally, now you are using the hardware resources. Okay, so that is one of the advantage. So that again boils down to cost as well. So that it reduces your cost as well for the uh, machines. So Earlier, where the virtualization technologies were not there, where you had to keep two separate applications, you would need a two virtual two two machines actually two hardware okay two servers you would need, but now it can be done using only one one physical hardware. So that's one advantage. The second uh, big advantage uh, we get is like each of the virtual machine is completely isolated. Okay, so there is no uh, dis uh, like disruption of of the application. So let's say the the first VM there is a web server running and all. So if it is crashes or anything, it it got hacked and also the damage will be limit limited to this VM. Okay, it is not going to uh, impact any other nearby VMs. Okay, so that that is one of the feature where a lot of um, companies they went for that to get better security to better isolate the applications okay and any other you can think of any other advantage one more advantage is that we can have multiple operating systems okay so here we can have a ubuntu here we, second one we can have a windows we can have a Red Hat, we can have a CentOS, okay. We can have different multiple flavors of the operating system uh, running on the same uh, physical machine. Okay. So then that's also one of the advantage. So these are all the advantages, but uh, there are again, few disadvantages as well. Okay. Like if we compare to the container technologies or the Kubernetes and all, so comparing to them, one of the disadvantage we see here is that for for hosting application, so let's say you want to host a Apache web server, okay, or a Nginx web server, you need a completely, you need a completely full-fledged operating system to be running, 
and again managing that operating system is a overhead you need to um, do the patch upgrade vulnerability remediation a lot of things will be there in that so that needs to be taken care so that amounts to additional cost so that's one of the disadvantage comparing compared to the other um, container technologies and again these all will be kind of a disk space or, or memory like footprint will be very high okay so uh, to maybe to start the application first the operating system needs to be booted and the application so it takes a lot, very long time okay. and again the operating system will need a lot of resources okay it would need some cpu some memory to to let the operating system run so that is also an overhead so these are some of the disadvantages if we compare them to the container technologies okay so this we saw this is also similar to the virtualization only but this is an operating system level virtualization so for example if you have used uh, maybe oracle virtual box or any kind of vm workstation so the bottom level you will have your laptop or computer then your main operating system then again on top of that you will have some uh, virtual box or something like that and on top of that you create the vms okay so this is for the virtualization part okay and coming to the containers one so container one what is the thing is they don't uh, need a separate hypervisor okay so they sit on top of the host operating system only but they don't need a full-fledged uh, operating system okay so let's compare these two diagrams now side by side so here you see the bottom level the physical hardware is there okay so then the host operating system and on the virtualization part we had a hypervisor here and then full-fledged operating systems here but comparing to the container or the kubernetes how it will be the container technology will be we have the server host operating system okay then we have a container engine okay, which we earlier saw docker and container d all those okay so those all technologies are there here so for the simplicity sake let's take it here docker is there okay, in this layer docker and on top of that now instead of a full-fledged operating system we don't need a complete operating system so let's say we want to just host a web server okay maybe an nginx web server or a http web server or a mysql database or anything so why you need a complete operating system right so it's definitely an overhead so so this is directly the app will be installed so app will be consisting of some set of files okay the code the runtime whichever files are needed and whatever dependent files it needs from the operating system okay so these will be grouped together and uh, they will call as a container okay so it will be running like that so on the left side let's say here in this vm maybe you would need four gig of ram or something like that here hardly you would need 128 mb or 256 mb okay so for the same thing and the startup and the starting up of the application and shutting down and all will be pretty fast this, this one because here we are not dealing with all the other extra features of the operating system, all the extra overhead of those things. Here we are purely talking about the application and its dependent files. So, and similarly, you can have many other uh, isolated containers. So the app one is hosted on one of the containers. So we earlier saw the namespace and C group. So it will be using those technologies okay, down the line and it will be in a separate it's isolated bubble it's there similarly for the app too and many more okay, like that and uh, in, in this way we are using very uh, the resources very efficiently here uh, only one uh, disadvantage we can see is like only we have one single container sorry one single uh, operating uh, host os kernel is there okay so uh, we we cannot have multiple uh, we can say containers with different operating systems okay so if we have a linux one we can have a linux uh, container only in that and if we are uh, and the containers will ultimately use the files from the from the host os 
Okay, so whatever kernel is there or packages are there, it is going to use from here. Okay, so that is one of the uh, things to be aware of. But here on the virtualization part, they are completely isolated. There is no dependency with with this. Okay, there is no they don't want any files and all that stuff from here. They will have their own operating system completely, and all the binaries, everything is there. Any doubts from this? And if we compare them with the virtualization we just saw, so it is kind of a looks, it mimics like a virtual machine itself. Okay, you can even log in to inside that okay, using some commands we can, we'll see later. We can even log in it. It will have its own like kind of a name and all it feels like a, a isolated server itself. Okay, so it mimics kind of that uh, virtual machine, but it actually it is not like a, a VM. It is not a full-fledged operating system. It is just bare minimum operating system, uh, sorry, bare minimum application files are only there, application file and the dependent dependencies, whatever it needs. Okay, so it gives us an illusion of it is running a separate isolated operating system, but yeah. And again, it is a process. Okay, so, this app one will be a set of processes. This also will be a set of processes. Okay. They will be, both these processes will be sitting in their own dedicated namespaces. So that's where the app one process, this the processes hosted within this container won't able to see the processes hosted within this container. Okay. They cannot disturb or conflict each other. Okay. These processes, they are completely isolated. So, the processes inside app one, they will think that, okay, I'm, I'm the only one in the machine. I'm using the entire server like that. Okay. So similarly, the view app two will get. Mm -hmm. So they use the namespace isolation and C group. So these are, these two are the fundamental uh, technology components used by the containers. Okay. And in addition to that, like when, when Docker started, so this is one of the main feature for that. Okay, like you are utilizing the machine in a very efficient way and in a very quick way, you can start your application and all. The second uh, main advantage was that like you can share this container. Okay, you can share the container files and all to, to any other user. Okay, so before that, like let's say here, uh, let's talk about when, if the container technologies are not there, in this, how it is happening is, uh, if you have to develop a application, which is using a web server, so you get the web server files. Okay, once the operating system is installed, then you need to install the web server uh, software. Okay, so those package again will be dependent on the guest OS, which guest OS is there. So you need that, a particular package version will be there. And on top of that, your application will be there. Okay, so application may use a lot of other dependents, dependencies will be there. Okay, so for example, if you have a Python based application, it could use Flask okay, or MySQL and all that. So you have to install all those in a, in a sequential way in a traditional uh, world if you're doing it. So to replicate that again, it is a pain. Okay, you have to give all the steps to a separate team. So let's say you are the development team and you want to give it to the uh, production implementation team and all. So they have to repeat those exact similar steps to get the application to get the application up and running. They have to install the same version of operating system. Again, the dependencies, packages, and on top of that, the application. Any any differences within that package versions and all that will is a major pain. Like it can cause further uh, issues in that. So they have to be careful for that. So it's a pretty difficult process. Okay. Uh, where if it is a three tier application, it, it's pretty very challenging to do that. But in the container part, uh, whatever container specific files are there, the dependent files and all, they are all packaged in a in a in a in a, in a set of files. Okay, so that's why it is very easy to share them. They are just a group of files. Okay, so it's very easy to share them, and uh, all the dependencies, everything will be packaged along with that container itself. Okay. So that way that your development is 
development speed of the development is is increased okay so you deploy you build the application once and you can run it anywhere and no worries of any dependencies and all that so that is taken care in in the container itself so then again it is easy for you to scale and replicate more number of containers using the same set of files you can do that and these all features we already discussed they're very lightweight and fast and uh, we can uh, they're very dense we can have many number of containers sitting inside that okay so let's take it a little bit to the next level now we will see how to install uh, maybe a docker container okay. and to get the download uh, like the latest uh, So whichever um, uh, operating system you have at at home or uh, maybe in cloud if you are using, so just Google that Docker install when we will go go to the Docker install page where we can check whichever operating system we are using. Either if you are using Windows, you can do that on the Windows yeah, or maybe send to as Debian, whichever one are there. So we will go with the Docker desktop for Linux. Where was the generic installations install on Ubuntu? So, yeah. And just we have to follow like this step by step, that, that's it. So let's do that. I think I have also more done in my machine. And to install the Docker engine and all, you on a Linux machine, you need to be a root user. So either you can. Uh, precede the sudo word sudo command on on all of them or we can directly sudo and then paste all these commands so let's say here if docker is there or okay so here docker is not there it is asking that we can install it using this as well but we will follow the standard docker documentation and we will do that so i'll we'll just copy that First, to remove any older instances if you have. Non genome, okay, I, we don't need the non genome one. Is, is it the same commands for CentOS as well, or? Uh, the uh, CentOS will be will be different. Let's see. It's for Docker, Ubuntu. Ubuntu also, they will have different versions. Let's see. Which version of Ubuntu having here? So for CentOS, I think CentOS is like kind of end of support, right? They will, I'm not sure if they have that latest one. Ubuntu they have given, a, yeah, CentOS also is there. So which version of, which version of CentOS, CentOS 7, 8, 9, okay, it's there. So here, nine. yeah, nine. so the steps are given here. So what I'm going to use, I'm using a Ubuntu server. So we'll, just in, go along with this document for that. Yeah. 
is removing any older installations of Docker. So nothing is found here. Then it is saying set up, we have to set up the repository and then we have to do the apt install. So we have to follow this. Similarly for the CentOS also, we have to create a repository and do the yum install or DNF install, I think. For the windows, like people who are on the windows, they can directly install the Docker desktop. And uh, using that, we can create our own Docker and all, all the commands we can, we can do from the windows as well. Yes. So as per the uh, product side, there is no difference as such, like from the command side, if you're creating a Docker image and all, there is not much difference on only the paths and all will be slightly different here, forward slash and all that, but the windows, it will be different. And all oh, Docker's official so GPG. This on the setup, we need to first create no for to practice everything. Yeah, yes. Yeah. So on the first topic one, we are doing the Docker part. So to create a Docker containers, okay, to deploy our own application and all to practice that we'll we need Docker. Okay. Even for Kubernetes, also it is um, it is from a developer or from an end user point of view, it is much easier to use Docker. They have other set of right, if you want, you can use the podman as well. So the, it is a separate container runtime, like equivalent to the Docker. But I've seen people are much more like much uh, kind of familiar with the Docker side, but the commands are literally same on, on both the podman so and the Docker. Of this kind of thing, no? First we need to be separate, I mean, do the setup, then after that we need to do the lab activities. Kind of yeah, thing. yes. So here so we are doing the... showing the screen. I mean, it's not easy to cope up with you actually for everyone. Yeah, yes. So he, more on, you know, if, I mean, uh, technically we need to do. Yeah, yes. But nowadays the installation steps are like kind of, uh, they've documented is in such a way that you just have to copy and paste. That's it. Okay. So there is no, uh, in, in, and there is not a lot of configuration settings and all these things needed. Yeah, just yeah, literally, yeah. Yeah. you know, you can go with GitHub sound, everything. They give a lot of commands are there. But yeah. we, where we need to use, which command we need to use, that one, we need to know everything. Yes, this is correct. Okay. So here, what we are going, we are directly going on the Docker site and install, um, Docker engine install. Okay, So here they have given whichever operating system based. Okay, And maybe you have to revisit this video to, to check the location. I will, I will ping in the chat as well, this link. So whoever wants to do on, on side by side, they can do, or they can do it later as well. Okay. But uh, the instructions are, are pretty straightforward. Whoever are kind of familiar with the Linux side and uh, whoever are doing on the Windows side, you can do Docker desktop. Okay. Just Google Docker desktop on Windows and go download the MSI package and it is next, next, next kind of install. Okay. So, Let's do that. Which step I am in? Yeah. So we are just literally here copy pasting those commands. That's it. So next it is saying update the app package when you copy it. So knowing the Docker and the container technologies is kind of your first step. Okay, towards the Kubernetes. Okay, so that's why we are revisiting this. This one. And finally, it is install Docker engine container D and the Docker comp. So it will do the 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 top level command, the Docker command. And on the earlier slide we saw, right? It Docker uses container D, so it is going to install that as well. Now a lot of operating system, they give the Docker native as well. So maybe you, on the CentOS, you can try it just directly yum install Docker. In in Ubuntu also it is there. Okay. But uh, this Docker version, like they don't support that. So here, if you see the unofficial 
packages to install our docker.io and all this. Okay, but in the Ubuntu, it installs this by default. So instead of doing all these, I can just do apt install docker.io. Okay. In CentOS, it's asking for install package podman docker to provide command docker. Oh, okay. Yeah, go ahead with that, whatever documentation they have given. So that's, okay, that's fine. But ultimately, you have to use the Docker command uh, in that. Okay. So here now our Docker completely installation is, is done. And let's see what the next one is. So we have followed steps. And finally, it is saying sudo docker run hello world. So it is asking us to run a container just to see whether all the things are fine or not. Yeah, so it went fine and it uh, showed here, hello from Docker. Okay. So here, when we do the sudo docker run hello world, so what it does is docker is the our main command. Okay. And second argument, what we are saying is that, okay, run this container. Okay. And uh, which container to create is uh, the image the the image name is hello dash world okay so what it does it will try to search that image locally first okay within your lo within your machine in your computer and if it doesn't find that image then it will go in the docker hub and it will pull the image from there okay so docker hub is kind of a you can say kind of a marketplace okay where uh, all all the big companies and and even individuals everyone they can share their uh, images okay so let's say you created one application so you can you can upload that image in the docker hub so that any other people can also use that so a lot of big enterprise like uh, maybe mysql and all that uh, so they will um, they will release their applications on on the docker image as well so people instead of installing it by using all the commands and all that they don't have to do and they just have to do this docker run the image name so this is kind of our first now let's see docker so it it said okay pulling unable to find image this we will see what are images and all that so we'll just see docker images okay so when it uh, when we do the docker run and hello world so it it first looks in the locally that image is there or not it was not there then it went to the docker hub and it pulled that image and it caches it locally now okay so next time when i do again docker run hello world so what it does it will it will find the image locally and it will run it from there it, it, it won't go and again pull the image okay so it will directly go so here we cannot see anywhere like it said download and all that So this is the installation part of the Docker engine. Uh, any doubt on the installation part? So this current installation on the Ubuntu, like uh, uh, whoever are, are like on the CentOS or Red Hat, anything, they have to follow that similar process uh, given in, in, the, in, in the documentation. So you can give it a try, maybe later, or if you are doing now, you can give it a try. Okay, and if you face any issues, just let me know. We can we can check it out. What whatever any issues are being are there. Okay. But if you have not uh, created the VM or anything like that, I would suggest go for a Ubuntu VM. All the packages, everything is there. It's uh, free to use as well. Okay. that's our installation part okay so uh, now we install the docker engine and just to go through the uh, architecture part okay so uh, whatever install currently whatever installation we have done we have installed this part the, the docker host as well as the client okay the docker command whatever we executed 
Okay, Docker run and also that is a client. Okay, that is the command. And it is internally talking to the Docker host. Okay, so uh, this, is, this is the our container D and all that set of packages are there, which it will talk and create the container, delete the container and all that so container management we can do using that. And on the on the operating system, let's see on the server, we can we can see some processes running with this is the command from the like uh, from the maybe on the Windows side we can we can go on the task manager and we can see right whichever processor are, are there. On the Linux uh, world, like any Linux in general, any Linux you take, our command will be ps minus ef. Okay, so it will show us all the processes whatever are running. And we have to narrow down to some, maybe some Docker and all we have to filter it, some text-based filter we have to do. In Windows, usually we use, I think some get str or something, recall on the Windows, but here it will be our grep command is there, okay, where we can, we can filter for some, some string coming out of the first command. So the first command is ps minus ef. Here we put a pipe character. So those command outputs will be further filtered on the second command, okay? So it is now giving only those lines which has got a text filter, text word Docker okay, in those. So here we can see uh, there is a definitely a process running called Docker D. Okay, so that, that is our server process here. So it is a client server architecture. So this is our server. Our client is our Docker command, which we are doing, okay? And it can be GUI also, like for the Windows, in the uh, they have the Docker desktop, so the client will be a UI based. Okay, you can even interact with the CLI as well in the Windows as well on the Windows. Okay, so it will interact with the Docker host there, and there is an optional component called the Docker registry, where we can pull the images, like or we can share the images, we can upload the images. Okay, so whatever application you de you develop. On, on the container, you can upload it on the registry okay, so that other teams can use that. Similarly, if you want to consume anything, you can consume it from here. So we, we saw the example right, uh, here where we do, do a Docker pull like that. Okay. So by default, what it does, it has uh, it will pull from the uh, Docker hub. So let's run one more image. So Docker, maybe Docker run, okay. And Let's run a web server okay, called HTTPD. So when we do this, it will first check locally if the image is there or not. And it is definitely not there. So it is going on the Docker Hub and it is finding those. So here it has, it is now running. Okay, the web server is running, but our prompt is still actually here locked in. So what is happening is what we have started this image. We are, sorry, we have started this container, but we have not, we are not running the container in the background. Okay, so we can Control C terminate that, and again do, again run the same command, but with a minus D here. Okay. So it is run as a daemon, it will run in the background. Okay. So when we do this, it just gives us the container ID, that's it. Okay. So to check how many containers are running and all, we can do docker ps. So this is one of the command. So uh, please note down those commands as when you are seeing. Okay. So there are so many commands will be there, but uh, I will uh, like uh, we will go through the commands which are useful from the Kubernetes point of view, okay, from the day to day. So this Docker ps command will show the running containers, whichever containers are running, and it will it is telling like okay, this is up since nine seconds. If we run it now in thirty-five seconds, it is showing which port and all it is running and all. It will give some random name as well to that container. Okay, we can fix that name as well, and it will generate a uh, random. Uh, container ID okay. and whatever command is running inside the container, it will tell. 
So, and one more command on, on when, while we are on the PS, so we can do Docker PS dash A. So this will show the earlier containers as well, which we created and which was terminated or which we closed and also it will show all the containers, okay, which were earlier also created. So the first time we created a hello world, okay, this one an HTTPD earlier. So these all will show, but Docker PS command, if you do, it will show only the running containers. Okay. Any doubts? Uh, fine. So now to stop this container, Docker stop. The give the container ID. We can even give few letters of the container that, that should be enough. Okay. So now in Docker PS, it is not showing anything. Let's run the container again. But now we will give uh, some name maybe my app. Okay. Yeah. So uh, here what we did, we gave the name uh, to the container as my app and same HTTPD is the container name, uh, so the container image which we are going to use. So now we will do Docker PS. Now it is showing the name as my app, whatever name. Earlier it was showing a randomly generated name. Okay. But now it is showing a fixed name. Okay. And one more uh, helpful command is like, if we have to go inside the container, okay, because we saw in the initial uh, diagram and all, uh, Permission denied document. Okay, so yeah, Vina, you need to run it through the sudo. Okay, run it with the root user ID. Okay, because the HTTPD and all it will use the uh, port 80, 443, and all that. So that was, uh, you have to run it using the root. So here also you can see I'm with the root user ID. Okay. So now in the earlier pick, in the layout we saw, uh, it is kind of, it gives an illusion of a VM. So let's go inside that container and see how it looks like. Okay, so to go inside that, we will use the command called docker exec. Okay. Docker exec. Okay. And then we have to give whatever container ID. Okay, So you don't have to maybe give full one, just give a few characters, that's enough. Okay. And what is the command you want to run inside that? So I want to run a shell inside that. Okay, so bin bash you can do. And again, it will be interactive. So docker exec hyphen it we can give. It is an interactive session we want to do. In that. So now you can see my prompt changed. Okay. Earlier I was there here. It, the name was server 100. As soon as I run this docker exec hyphen it, the name of the container, the container ID and this command. Okay, so now the bin bash command is running inside that and I am inside the VM. Okay, so, so you can see the standard commands won't, won't be applicable. So here the host name of this is, is some, something randomly given. Okay, whatever ID is there, that is the host name itself. Okay. And let's see anything. So it has got its own kind of file system, which is using from the base operating system. Okay. It is using the, the resources from the base operating system. Okay. And if we need any command, you know, like here, maybe PS command, uh, PS EF won't, won't be running. Okay. Why it is not running? Because in, in the initial definition, we saw the container is, is a set of files. Okay. It can be a single process or a set of process, set of files bare minimum to that for the application okay so this is a web server so it will be only having the files related to the web server that's it okay so these are all the files which are related to the web server so it won't need the files related to the ps command okay or any other command like that so it won't un bundle it along with that okay. so maybe for some troubleshooting let's say if i want to have something yeah you can you can still install it inside that, okay? But whatever whatever changes you are doing inside a container, so this is a very important 
a node. Whatever changes you are doing inside a container, these are not persistent. Okay, so they will go away once the container is is down, and you restart the container. Those changes will will vanish. Right. But maybe sometimes to troubleshoot or something like that, yeah, you can go ahead and do some changes inside that. Then that is that is fine. Now when I do exit, I will come back to my base machine. Okay. And I see no Docker PS. This is still running. So let's say this is a web server, right? So yeah, how to how to check what what IP is that? It's kind of a VM, right? But how how to connect to that VM and see that? Okay. One way is to see this using from here. We are inside the VM. Now let's say if we have a uh, it won't have a full fledged browser, but it will have maybe some command called curl or curl is also not get. Let's say wget command is there or the, both are not there. Okay. So let's install that command and we will see the web page at least in, inside the, the container or that illusion as a VM it is giving. So I will do app install and get update. We install the app get oh sorry app get app to install curl. So in in curl is a very uh, small handy command. Okay, it is it is kind of a browser but a text based. Okay, so whatever you are doing uh, in a Windows and all like a Chrome browser and all, it's kind of a browser but it is a text based browser. So let's say curl now. We are inside the VM. Okay, so when we just do localhost. So here it is giving the output. Okay, this is the website it is giving and it says it works. Okay, so here we connected to the uh, HTTPD web server, which is running okay, on, on port 80. And again, to check that we don't have the netstat command as well. So that also we can install to see okay, what all two ports are there. That is purely option. So let's see how to connect it from our main machine. Okay, now we came back to our base machine server 100 and now here we do docker ps so this all the vms okay whenever we create, sorry all all the containers uh, when we create it will be assigned a dynamic ip address okay by the docker engine so let's see what is the ip address so for that we can do docker inspect so this is one more command you can note it down docker inspect and just paste that id it will give a lot of details okay so for everything it will give all the whatever things it, it, it all the details it will give that but here we are interested in this line which is says the ip address okay so here it is showing 172.17.02 okay so on from our base machine let's do this so we can reach it okay from our base machine now we can reach to the to the here okay but now our question is how can we reach it from external machine to the base machine okay that's fine it is working from here but as an end user I, I would use some chrome or something like that right so let me see what is the ip of my base machine so in the Linux and all, now it's a very common command to check the IPs, IPA, okay. or you can do if config hyphen A, if config hyphen A, which is a old uh, de de uh, deprecated command, but IP, yeah. So it is showing the IP as 192.168.1.24, okay. So let's see what is the IP So just to give you how we are doing is this is our base machine, base machine, and inside that we have. Uh,
So inside that we have got our Docker container. Okay. Uh, what is the name web server we have maybe named or uh, this container? So we saw that uh, the base machine has has got a IP address of uh, 182.168.24. That. And similarly, our web server container had had its own IP. Okay, this one 172.17.02. this is our ip of the container so from inside the base machine here yes i can reach it to the web server that's fine so now our requirement is how to access the application which is running inside the docker container from outside okay so let's say we have one more machine here uh, let's say server 02 something okay or maybe a laptop base laptop and Okay, so it will have its some separate IP, whatever my machine is there, it will have a separate IP. So how to connect? So let's say, let's connect to the base machine. We will give HTTP 192.168.1.24. Okay, we don't get anything. So what is happening here? Uh, our request from this, from my base machine, from my laptop, it is it is going to the base machine to to this Docker uh, to the base machine where the Docker engine is installed. Okay, but inside that it doesn't know how to how to map it to here. Okay, so let's see that part, like how to map a set of port here to this. Okay, so when we do HTTP. Uh, can anyone tell which port we are trying to reach on that? What port does HTTP maps to? 80. 80, yeah, good, thank you. So it is going to the base machine of port 80, but there is no uh, further uh, mapping or anything like, okay, this 80 port should, should go to this. Okay, so let's do that mapping part. Okay. So Docker PS, we will do. So now what we will do, we will we'll, we'll close the uh, container, we'll stop the container and we'll start it by a mapping. So let's go back to wherever we did Docker run, yeah, this one, minus D. And uh, we will add one more part here, minus P, P stands for the port, okay. So here we have to give two, Two arguments okay one is uh we'll just type in a simple way the base machine port okay and container port okay so we have to give the input in this way so which port on the base machine we are trying to map to the container port okay and our container port here we know from the output we saw that it is running on port 80 inside the container so let's give some base port. Okay. So let's give something different. Okay. We will go 80 as well, but let's give something different completely. We'll, let's give 80, 80. So what I'm saying here, Docker run this uh, container. Okay. And inside the container port is 80. And this is my base machine port. So base machine port of 80, 80 will be port forwarded or will be mapped to the 80. So whatever traffic will come to my base machine to the server 100 on port 8080, it will be diverted to this container on port 80. Okay, so let's do, uh, oh, is already used. Yeah. So let's give some different name. Yes, so our container is running here. Now we can see here. So on our base machine, the port number 8080 is like kind of redirected to port 80 of TCP inside that. Okay. So let's try to reach out on port 8080 first. 
Okay, and here I'm doing OTT. So here now we can see that it, it is showing that it works and it is this output is coming from the inside the container. Okay. And any queries uh, in this part? So let's docker exec in, into that and uh, So is the container ID, you can give just few starting characters can go. So where is the file? Let's see in this htdocs. So this is our file index.html where the content is coming from. It works. Okay. So let's try to change it to something else so that at least we will 100% validate that. Okay, definitely it is coming from here only and not, not somewhere else. Okay. Because container we we just know that it will have very bare minimum files so even the command and all to edit the file won't be there so let's see the vi command vi command is also not there so we will use the simple echo command okay so echo command what it does in in windows also the echo command is there so it will just echo anything to the console so let's say echo hello world i've written so it it will just show here okay we can redirect this output to some file okay, by using this redirection character. So let's do that because we don't have any command to edit the file. Okay, here. So let's do echo. This is container. Sorry, any question? So let's give that. But we have to give it in this same format because it's a web-based file. And right here. Instead of it works, let's do it. Container. Okay. And redirect it to index.html. So now our file shows this this is coming from container so let's refresh this page so now we can see this is coming from the container okay so definitely we proved that okay whatever port forwarding or the port mapping which is happening it is definitely this data we are we are getting it from our inside the container okay. let's go back to the base machine and see the docker ps again so this this uh, interpretation is very important where this uh, 0.0.0.0 what it uh, signifies is all the ip address of the base machine okay so maybe the base machine would have uh, multiple network cards or many ips are there so it means that all the all the addresses whatever is there whichever address you try to reach on the base machine on port 8080 that will be redirected to the container on port 80 okay so uh, this signifies that that one. Okay. Let's see that thing. And one more thing about the thing we are here. So Docker PS. Uh, so yeah, we can do exec here. Okay. So even we cannot see the processes here. Uh, let me see if I can install that. I just want to show you that the processes, we will launch two containers and see that whatever the process IDs okay, are completely separated. Okay, So they don't conflict or anything like that. So I think it's apt. Because the container will have bare minimum files only for the application. So any additional things we have to just install on the runtime. Apt install thing net as a PS tools. Install PS command. Not sure which packages that ps command is for so let's see proc ps okay proc ps p r o c p s yeah. okay we have to update that 
Yes. So this command we just installed just to troubleshoot to see what all processes are running. Okay. So here it is showing only the command. This or only we have in this kind of uh, illusion of the VM which we are getting this container, we can see this bin bash which we only just started when we launched inside when we came inside the container. Okay, and this is the ps minus you have just executed, and this is the apart from the httpd command. That's it. Okay, so only these are running. Okay, but in our base machine, let's open one more terminal. Okay. Anyway, we are in the main machine now. So in the main machine, when we see a PS minus EF, there are so many processes are there. Okay. But uh, when we came inside the VM and when we do that PS minus EF, okay, we can see only these ones. Okay. So here also we can see the, the PID one, okay, is the first starting process of any operating system. So here uh, in our base machine also, there will be one PID with the with the PID one. Okay, so we can see these these all uh, the PIDs which are starting with the one. Okay, so when the VM launch uh, starts, our uh, main machine is starting. So there are, there are uh, processes which are starting with the one as one. Okay, but inside the container as well, we can see that is there. So uh, this process it will think that okay, it's owning the entire hardware and everything like that. It will think it's a VM. But actually, it is a container okay, with a set of files. So this is our set. Similarly, if we have any other uh, kind of a, we can do Docker, uh, Docker run hyphen D nginx web server. It will have also its own similar set of files. Okay, inside that, a similar set of processes. So that's why the starting of the application and the stopping of the application, it's it bear, hardly takes a few seconds, that's it. But think if this application is sitting on a VM and you have to restart the VM and all, it will take at least maybe a couple of minutes. Okay. So this is the advantage. So here now we have got one VM with HTTPD and one another VM with Nginx. Okay, both will have separate, completely isolated kind of uh, processes. So in, inside this bubble, whatever its own processes will be there. Okay, and any other uh, process. Uh, so we have any, one more container now, it will have its own processes completely. Both are isolated from each other. Okay, they won't disturb each, each other. They won't uh, overlap or anything like that. They won't cause any conflict. Okay, so because it is using the base features of the C groups and the namespaces. Okay. So uh, any doubts still now for the Docker commands or anything? And uh, anyone trying it live uh, as I also test or, or they're planning to, or are you planning to no, test it? I mean, how we do those kind of setups, then also how we can proceed actually. Okay. So, the, exactly. I mean, yeah. we have been, actually, we know the things concept, how we mm -hmm. should proceed those kind of things. I mean, the setup of oh. the install the Ubuntu, then after the base server, we need to create the container of this. How oh. we can, I mean, yeah. Yeah. So, 
once we done the setup then easy to mm-hmm. know we can do yeah so uh, i would say first uh, in my own personal machine also so what i have done is i have installed oracle vm virtual box okay so that that is one of the very uh, easily so installable okay, okay. Uh, yeah, we can easily obtain it and install it but at least we need some some fair amount of spec on the laptop or the desktop wherever you are you are testing okay at least maybe uh, 4 gb of ram and all the entire machine i am saying so whatever ubuntu machine you want to create or send to us they hard, they will take very less resources okay you can you can give 1 gb of ram that is sufficient okay and 20 20 or 25 gb of disk so here also in this machine also wherever i am practicing you would say it's a very uh, small machine okay 25 gb i have totally have allocated to this that's it okay and uh, ram also i think it's a very uh, 4 gb i have allocated but it's more than uh, 2 gb is more than enough for 1 gb also is fine okay to test that but we will feel a little bit slow when we install the docker and all but i would say 2 gb is more than sufficient okay so to start that i would say go for the virtual box uh, download the virtual box install it and on then you need to download the uh, ubuntu or the uh, centos or whichever om- image we have to download the iso file okay so let me write some steps in it i will send you those so how to practice and all we need to run the sorry uh, audio was not muffled out little bit what is the question uh, no sorry your audio is uh, is it only to me yeah or you can type it in the chat i think you sorry i cannot hear your audio clearly okay so so what we are doing is downloading oracle vm only for the testing purpose i'm saying okay the oracle vm virtual box okay you, you the people who are doing on the windows one they can do on the windows as well but better to do it on the linux one because gradually as we go to the next level of the of the uh, kubernetes one where we will install mini cube and all that so it is much easier on the linux part okay to do that so we can download oracle vm virtual box then you have to download any any linux uh, flavor i would advise go for ubuntu latest it is free ubuntu iso okay and then we have to create a vm on the oracle vm virtual box oracle vm virtual box we have to create a vm using that ubuntu image okay and once the image is is created okay then we can connect to that vm either you can do inside that virtual box itself or you can do from outside okay so i'm i'm like how i'm connecting it outside from a putty client okay so this is a client to connect to the vm but this vm is not running in my laptop okay it is in a separate desktop where i have oracle vm virtual box okay so you can either connect through putty or you can directly connect to that virtual box itself whichever way you prefer and the rest of the things are common like whatever we have to install the docker engine okay and okay docker engine we have to install so after that the steps are same okay so only this is the extra part you need to do so other alternative is that if you have some free subscription to any cloud maybe aws azure ibm and all you can create a vm there itself the ubuntu vm okay and you can directly log in and follow from the docker in- engine install part okay so this is this two ways i can see where we can uh, we can practice but one thing i one thing i want to stress is it needs a lot of practice okay so this docker kubernetes is not like that we can read the stuff or see the videos and all and go through it needs a pure hands on okay because the so many commands are there in in the kubernetes you need a you need to do the hands on okay the installation of the cluster part upgrade of the cluster and all in if you are uh, appearing for any interviews as well or going for the maybe exam ckad and all these all questions will be all hands on is mandatory the exam itself is a hands on exam full hands on exam okay so uh, i would stress again to 
install that either virtual box if you have a sufficient uh, spec of a laptop or, or desktop lying around you can use that and uh, do the docker in install and start practicing with the docker command which we today we covered okay and uh, the docker installation part we already saw here path so th th this is today we did very basic of the docker containers and all okay in the next class what we are going to do is we'll create our own application in the docker so what today we what we did is we we use the image which is already there in the in the docker hub in the cloud somebody has already created us an image and we just executed it we just used it okay docker run nginx but in most of the cases in applications or in organizations you need to create your own custom application okay so we will cover that part next okay well uh, we will see how to create a docker file and how to create a, a, a maybe python based application or we'll take one more application whichever is applicable from microsoft as well many of the vendors give their own test applications as well so we will host that test application on on the docker container okay so next will be that and how to push that created image whatever image you created to a uh, uh, to a container registry okay in the diagram we saw there is a container registry okay so this this part i'm referring to the container registry part okay so because in, in actual i'm talking about an actual organization day-to-day -day part so these all tasks will be there okay application team would have given you uh, some file a docker file or some application they would have barely just given you application that's it it is purely a python based files there is nothing docker related nothing so you have to create it you have to package it as a docker container docker image and then you have to send the image to a docker registry maybe to a, uh, azure kubernetes uh, sorry azure container registry or the aws container registry okay, or any of the organization registry like um, jfrog and all and from there your build pipeline and those again next level of complexity will come how to do how to use that image and build and deploy the application okay so the, that's why these all three things we have to touch uh, while we are going through this uh, the first uh, topic okay uh you know you you sent a query right that we have to use the configure web server no uh, you don't have to like configure web server but just familiarity with any of the web servers will be helpful okay like kind of a uh, nginx or uh, sorry for kind of a nginx http renal because you will receive those files from the application team and all so a familiarity is is better okay to talk with the app team or to the counterpart okay so we are not completely doing a development and all so we are getting those pre-built development files and we will deploy it on the container okay so that will be the role of the kind of a devops engineer or whoever is managing that layer of either docker or kubernetes okay so they do the deployment part okay so i think that's it for today's class okay any, any queries before we close okay that's good uh yeah i think that's all i think the video will be shared by amit he will share you the video okay uh, thanks a lot for the class then okay that's all for today